Okay, I think we're kicking off now um, live on Facebook. So thank you to everyone who's joined us. My name's Dan. I am the chairman of the Philatelic Traders Society, which is the International Society for Philatelic Professionals. Um, I'm joined today by you know, some big weeks, a big day for philately. I'm joined here by uh, with uh, Peter Coburn, uh, President Elects of the Royal Philatelic Society of London, Marcus Orsi, Chief Philatelist of David Feldman, and Graham Beck of Exploring Stamps. I will get everyone to introduce themselves. We are here today to talk about the Sotheby's auction um, taking place live right now. So we're also keeping an eye on what's going on. Um, we might touch on the coin, but as philatelists, we're really here to talk about the British Guiana one cent magenta and the block of inverted jennies. So um, it's going to be an exciting day and um, we all want to know how much it's going to go for, who it's going to go to and where it's going to end up and if we'll ever see it again. Um, I'll kick off with um, each person just giving an introduction. So we'll start with Peter. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, ladies, gentlemen, and um, I think Suzanne's got her dog alongside. Um, and um, my name's Peter Coburn. I've been collecting stamps since I was a kid. And um, my uncle came back from South Africa with all those funny little orange trees uh, when I was about three or four years old. And um, that set me off. Um, and uh, I've now um, become through um, a great good fortune. Uh, I'm about to be elected to the um, presidency of the Royal Philatelic Society London. Now this society is the oldest in the world uh, and uh, we have about 2,500 members and at the last count from about 80 countries. So we are truly a worldwide organization. One of the things that, um, the, that the Royal does is run um, an expertizing a, a group called the Expert Committee, which was set up way, way, way back in the mists of time in order to try to cut down on forgeries. And the, 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 the spoiling of the, of the market, which was developing in the, in the 1870s and 1880s, um, with a, a lot of reprints and forgeries coming into uh, the market. So they set up an Expert Committee. The Expert Committee has seen um, this uh, extraordinary stamp. Um, I'm afraid I can't say it's beautiful, but it is extraordinary. Um, it is iconic, uh, and it is the, the only known copy of the one cent magenta from British Guiana. It, um, it came to the Royal, um, it's, be, it's been through the Royal's hands several times. Um, it was described in great detail in 1908. Um, I think that probably at that time it must have gone into the Ferrari collection. Um, it came again uh, more recently, um, and Patrick Pearson, who was then in charge of the expert committee, wrote uh, a paper about it in 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 uh, twenty um, uh, something um, twenty fourteen. No, he didn't. He wrote it in 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 twenty oh seven, I think. And then Chris Harmon, who is the current chairman of the uh, expert committee. Um, investigated this stamp yet again before it was sold to Richard Wiseman, um, Wiseman, Stuart Wiseman, I beg your pardon, um, in, in 2014, 2015. Um, and it was declared to be genuine. Um, around that time, uh, 19, 1998, I think, there was another uh, stamp which was offered to the Royal uh, as a second copy. Um, but it didn't take too long uh, with the help of various forms of um, uh, magnification and uh, light changing and other uh, ways of, of looking at paper to discover that the, the even scruffier copy which had been presented as a, as a real one cent was in fact a four cent which had been doctored and changed into a one cent. And then the color had been completely changed from blue to uh, magenta or similar color. Anyway, that's where I'm coming from, and 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 that's um, the interest I have in in this particular stamp. Um, I'm going to leave it there for a moment. Let the others have a go, and then I'll come Thank back you. and tell you about um, 
some 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 chats I had with Stuart and Jane Wiseman later on. Fabulous, thank you. Um, so we think the one that's up there is is genuine. Thanks to the Royal at the moment. <laughs> um, I'll move on to Marcus. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Well, I mean, the interesting thing is, of course, we've, we 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 where there's a great focus. I'm going to go on about me in a minute, but there's a great focus on the one set, and of course, we we we've got to not forget about um, the the little the little block of four stamps, um, which um, it, it doesn't it doesn't I wouldn't say it rivals it, but it's certainly as far as as far as a 20th century rarity is certainly up there uh, as one of the most important 20th century, century rarities. So just so that we um, focus on that as well, uh, because of course the, the fun thing about all stamps is it's all about their rarity. And of course the, the famous story about the, uh, the inverted um, Jenny is of course it was owned by one guy, Colonel Green. And I think the story goes, he had it on his yacht and the yacht caught fire and they salvaged large parts of this because he had the complete sheet and they salvaged large parts of the sheet but some of them didn't make it and and some of them were damaged so of course this all adds to the myth of of rare stamps it's one of the exciting parts about i've, I've always been involved in rare stamps all my career so that's the fun thing that's what makes stamps valuable we're going to talk about how stamps are valuable today and that's one of the things is the stories and all the intrigue behind it and who owned it and what happened and all that it, it's not just the stamp it's the actual story that goes with it so anyway Absolutely. you can tell I, you can tell i like to chat um i'm just going to do a breaking news that's why we're live guys and we've just had notice of the first part of the weizmann collection has sold at uh, sotheby's um, the estimate was 10 to 15 million US dollars. The lot has sold at 19 million, 509,750 wow. US dollars. So 4,000, 509,000, uh, sorry, 4 million more than the, uh, than the estimate. So if that's a sign of what's to come on the next two, then nice numbers. Okay, sorry, Marcus, back to you. Sorry. And rarity. Right. Feldman and, and the Museum of Philately. Yes, so yes, so um, my background, um, um, a bit like Peter, I was a collector from the age of six and um, took took up collecting again. I, I mean, I was a collector when I was a, a kid, but then um, in my mid-teens, I took up um, collecting again, but then I had a passion to actually become a stamp dealer. And at the age of 15, I started working for a, a small local stamp dealer in, in Dublin, where I, where, I, where I grew up. And um, fortunately, being in Dublin, which is the, which is the, the hometown of David Fellman, which is the, the, the man I ended up working for, um, through a series of events, I, I met him and joined the company uh, 40 years ago. Um, and um, so it's been a it's been a, a, a fantastic um, experience. Uh, I could say travel the world, um, valuing stamps, being involved with um, great auctions over the years. The Mauritius auction of of Kanai in '93 being probably one of the highlights. Um, so it's I've been I, I've been I feel very blessed to be, and I'm also a collector, a collector of Irish revenues and. Um, and a lot of other things. So um, I just feel hugely privileged to have been part of this hobby. Uh, I consider myself a, a, a lover of, of, of stamps and postal history. As much as I'm a dealer or involved in the business of it, I also feel like I'm a collector as well in many ways. And the Museum of Philately is a, an add-on that, that I've uh, been working with, actually Isabel Klemke, who is part of this team. Uh, at uh, the PTS, she's been helping us too. We're growing a um, an online, virtual online place to to show great collections. And as much as we are hoping for uh, the return of the physical exhibition, um, which is something we're all uh, anticipating in the next uh, months, certainly, hopefully, with a, a successful Stampex coming up. 
Um, at the same time, we are all affected by uh, what's been happening in our world. So the idea of a virtual world or a virtual exhibiting world, uh, we, we cannot ignore. So we have to sort of say, well, what's going to be the future? Well, I think my, my exciting part is I think it's going to be both. It's got to be both. Um, so that's what the Museum of Philately is, is really all about. So they, Absolutely. Absolutely. I've just got some more breaking news. Um, the inverted Jenny plate block, which was estimated to sell between five and seven million US dollars, has sold at four million eight hundred and sixty thousand US dollars. So slightly under the estimate, but pretty much five million dollars for that. Um, I guess the, the 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 one set magenta is going now. Oh, we've just going right now. And oh, we've even it, got to Dr. Graham. Guys, it's sold for under its estimate. It's sold for right. Graham, seven, announce it. Announce it. Tell us what is it just sold for? Where was it? Looks estimated? like it's seven seven mil. So eight million three hundred and seven thousand is the official figure from Sotheby's. Graham, who are you? Eight what? million. What three hundred? What? <laughs> million three hundred and seven thousand us dollar bid us dollars bidding is closed so tell us who are you and what do you think about that graham wow let's talk about that for a second that's um so i guess i guess i'm somewhat disappointed uh didn't go for uh i guess it was record breaking 8.4 yeah, yeah 9.5 million was was sold so yeah i don't know i but it, this is an exciting thing. I, I, I mean, I, I wasn't um, big into philately last time it sold. So I've thoroughly enjoyed the hype leading up to this. Uh, uh, yeah, so my name's Graham Beck. I work, uh, my hobby is, of course, making videos uh, on YouTube on a channel called Exploring Stamps. I've been doing so since 2016. Uh, I was actually a, a young stamp collector uh, growing up in South Africa and then put the stamps away and came back in 2016 and explored it online with the world as I was being taught by my viewers uh, and grew from there. And so the channel has had 2 million views, 20,000 subscribers and over 100 videos uh, present. Now, um, I had the privilege of seeing the One Cent Magenta just on Sunday. Sotheby's had actually put it up for display for the public to view. And they did this in London as well as New York in the days leading up uh, to the auction. And uh, I had no problem at all walking in there and going right up to the stamp and even got a chance to hold it, which is quite something. I think it's quite special because I had seen it before in a very dark room in an enclosed case that was impossible to actually get a proper glimpse from it uh, in the Smithsonian. And here it was on display. Um, but I think uh, I have some thoughts on the, the, just this auction. I, the, the key thing is that I think the social media element has allowed everyone to really get hyped up, collectors of all level leading up to this. I'm curious to see what the discussion is now during the, uh, right now on social media, what people's thoughts are. Uh, it's just a different time um, in philately where auctions become real mainstream discussions from all levels of the community. So uh, that's, that's where my, I'm coming from and my excitement within, within this um, event. Why you feel a bit disappointed with that then? Why? Million. Yeah, go for it. Well, I, I was hoping for a record breaking. It, it, it should have broken. I don't know. So it's it's broken a record what two three times in a row. So now this is this is the first time it's it's got to sit back down at a lower price. I think I don't know, but we is that including? I don't know if it's that's including the buyer's premium and the and the taxes that that eight. Mm. Point three. Let's find out if it is, then maybe it did break a, uh, then didn't break a record. If it yeah. doesn't, yeah. then then we'll find out. But yeah, I mean, I don't know because that element of it broke the record adds to its social, uh, its um, mainstream media hype, right? Yeah. So, so that's what that's what catches the news. Yeah, and I think that's what we keep on talking about and we keep on hearing about is that from a philatelic standpoint, the average collector, if they suddenly got given eight million quid might choose to buy some other items. Mm. And this stamp itself is um, something which is creating noise outside of the philatelic world. And that's a great thing for the hobby. And if it was breaking, record breaking again, um, then you, we would probably be seeing more mainstream press than we might see um, as a result of that. Maybe the numismatic guys will be pretty chuffed with the double eagle going for 
for a bit more than the, the estimate. So, so just thinking about um, Marcus as, as an auctioneer, kind of what's gone on around that estimate then? And what do you think might have happened in the, in the run up to this and, 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 and during the last kind of 12 minutes? Well, I think maybe setting the scene from what what went previously, which was in 2014, where I was very uh, fortunate to have been present at that um, uh, at that auction. Um, I think that the you challenge, and I, I've been involved oh, with I'm not playing with you. Huge. With, da with David Feldman, I've been involved with um, quite a number of million plus uh, sales, um, uh, probably more, and I don't, I don't want to boast, but it's just the truth, um, more, more, more million dollar sales in our company than any other company. Um, so I've had got that experience and I can tell you, uh, uh, Graham, it's a fantastic price. Um, you know, for me, and, and, and I'm sure Peter would agree, we just don't, there is just nothing around that, that even compares to this kind of level. So it's fantastic. I mean, my the excitement for me is that it's sold. And that to me is phenomenal. Yes, it would have been great if, it had, if we'd had pipped that, you know, um, but no, I think I think they're going to be delighted with that result. Uh, I, I don't think that we should, you know, because we're we've got to understand. I try to under, I try to explain this to friends who don't know anything about our business. The stamp business is an imperfect market. It's not like gold or anything that has definite values. There's no definite value. Let's be honest. And Peter, Peter, Peter's seen seen the stamp and the the, the royal have, have examined it. It's not the most beautiful item, let's be honest. It just isn't. Um, it's a small, discolored piece of paper. So if you put it in that context, um, it's a phenomenal marketing job, in my opinion, to have brought it to this place. And, um, you know, don't wanting to forget Erwin um, Weinberg, who was the guy who really made the stamp what it is today, because when he got it, he took it on a world tour and he flew in, in, in fancy jets. Um, he had the, 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 the famous picture of him having the, the stamp strapped to his arm with, with um, uh, handcuffs and, and security guards. And at that time, it got huge publicity worldwide. So I think that was an event or, the, or a series of events then that brought that stamp to that level. So it was promotion, marketing. Yeah, and, so, um, so one of the interesting things about the marketing is, and we saw this in one of the Museum of Philately um, uh, YouTube videos, was um, the idea of the stiletto that's been penciled onto the one cent magenta by Stuart Weitzman um, has, you know, is a great marketing ploy. It puts the stamp into a different area into fashion and to it, it, it potentially would would attract a higher bidder so do we think maybe given that the estimate do you think it's gone the other way does anyone have any views on whether that stiletto might have taken the price down a bit since last time i don't think so um but i'm not entirely surprised that it's the coin which has gone way way above estimate and it's the stamp which is actually sold below estimate that doesn't actually surprise me um, and the reason for that in, in in my opinion and i'm not a numismatist but i know a little bit about them and i have friends who are and that is that there seems to be far more numismatists um, certainly in the in in the uh, wealthy bracket than there are stamp collectors um, and, and that is why I think um, that difference has now been revealed. Um, also, uh, the, the, the double eagle coin is American. Uh, the stamp is from some crazy little British colony, which has been entirely forgotten about, um, uh, you know, down, d d down south. Um, and I think that makes a difference. Um, but I, 
you know, as far as the graffiti on the back of the stamps concerned, um, it's something which as a collector um, uh, leaves me cold, quite yeah. cold. In fact, yeah. almost, almost angry. Yes, um, I agree, I agree. But, uh, as a, a, a method of provenance and history and um, all that, uh, you know, the, the marketing area, of course, it's of great interest. Um, there's one, there's one uh, mark on the back. I'm not entirely sure that it's been identified yet. Um, it certainly wasn't identified in 2014 when the Royal saw it. Um, you know, but it, it, it is an, in, in, it's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, so when we look at, um, you know, we, we've talked about, um, I mean, obviously, we don't have Stuart Weizmann here to tell us his decision making process around why he decided to A, mark it like so many other people, B, to a stiletto, C, do it in pencil, three, do it the sizes, do it, you know, on the side it is. There's, there's a lot of questions I'm sure many people would like to ask him. Um, but you've met Stuart, Peter. So, um, you know, and he has you know, he has had the stamp in a, it, you know, in a place where people can see it. And so do you, is it, do you think he signed it and he's felt a bit cheeky about it? Do you think he signed it after having consultation with philatelists or with other people in, in, in the auction space? You know, what would you think having met him and tell us a story of you meeting him? Um, I don't really know. I, I can't answer your question directly about why he wrote on the back of it. What I can say is that first of all, um, Judy and I were privileged to have dinner with him at the Smithsonian um, dinner at Washington about um, or towards the end of, 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 of the last year that any of us could do anything, 2019. Um, and um, they, Stuart and Jane are the most delightful people. There's no question about that at all. They're absolutely delightful. Um, they are very down to earth. They are very, um, I think it's called anchored these days is the right term. Um, and... Um, you know, uh, to, to, to the extent that, that you know, Jane swapped um, uh, mobile phone numbers with, with my wife, who she's never seen in her life before, and may never see again. I do hope so, but we never know. Now, Stuart uh, was, was being um, uh, interrogated by, by my wife. She likes to know about people. She's a great talker. And um, his reason for owning these items, and certainly the, the one cent magenta, was very much based on the idea that he felt that um, one, he could afford it, two, he um, didn't mind owning it for a bit, but he never took it home. Mm. It's never been in his house, nor of the other items. They went straight to places where they could be displayed. Yeah. And he was incredibly generous with that. I mean, it went to the Smithsonian. It yeah. went from the Smithsonian to Monaco on two occasions for the, for the um, great uh, Monaco exhibitions, which takes place every two years. And, and I've seen it in all three places. Um, and of course, it came to London with Sotheby's before it was sold to him. So his, his motive of owning it was really in the public interest, if you like. It was to be displayed. In the same way that, that some folk who buy very expensive art, um, you, you know, um, Van Gogh and things like that, they want to show them off and they want to show them in, in, in galleries and things like that. There is also, of course, a large cohort of people who hide these things away. Yeah. Um, you know, they spend 30 million, 30 million dollars or pounds or whatever it is on a, on a painting. You never see it again. Yeah, and I think Graham, you recently had a, um, a discussion with the chat <laughs> conversations of philatelists about who do they think might be bidding on this? Do they think it's a dealer? Do they think it's a collector? Do they think it's a set of investors? So do you want to tell us a little bit about what you learned through that and what your views are on who might have got this? We don't know. You were just trying to see if we can somehow find out, but um, <laughs> or if there's any news on that, but who might have got it or where you think it might end up? Do you think we'll ever see it again? I think that's, that's all the mystery behind this stamp, which is probably what draws so much fascination and, and interest into it, right? Who has it right now? Is it a stamp collector? You can only, I mean, my, you know, in a childhood, I really hopes that it is a collector, somebody who loves stamps, somebody who wants um, to see, uh, have others see the stamp, somebody 
who really appreciates the philatelic component of it. Or more likely is it the investor or somebody who's just looking to have a trophy? Because at the end of the day, the stamp is, I, we, we discussed this in that, in that video, the stamp has gone beyond the category of stamps. It's sitting with the world of uh, jewels and fine art. It's something that gets signed versus you know, stored very appropriately uh, among your other stamps. So I don't know who has it. We, no. and that, I guess the mystery is, will we see it again? We can only hope. Or will it turn, out, uh, turn up 30, 40 years from now? Or is it going to show up in the Smithsonian or some other museum tomorrow? We don't know. <laughs> will someone sign it as soon as they've got it? Or will they wait until they're about to sell it again, if they sign it at all? Right, exactly. We don't know. That, that's, that's the excitement, I think. There's another way, there's another way to look at it. Um, and I'll, I'll just interject with a, a story of another stamp, which, which I've been involved with, which is the Three Skilling Yellow of Sweden. And this was a famous stamp that um, was, again, it's got its... It's got its um, um, uh, critics, in other words, there are people who are not sure about it. But anyway, it 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 it's passed all the tests, and it's a a stamp that was should have normally been printed in in green, and it was and it was printed in in the yellow of the eight skilling of the same set. Um, and for a number of years, this stamp had been bouncing around different people, and it was sold. Um, we actually offered it three or four times and sold over those years and got record prices for a European stamp and so on. But it finally ended up um, with a, a collector in Sweden and it was shown recently at the Stockholm exhibition. But the beauty, and of course, as a, as a collector myself, the beauty is it was exhibited within the context of a, of a collection. So it's just a, an item being, yes, famous and all that, but in the context of telling a story about Swedish stamps, classic Swedish stamps. And of course, that was the case with DuPont, because when we sold the DuPont collection uh, of British Guiana in 2014, um, at the time prior to it being offered in auction, the one cent was part of that collection. So it was part of the story of British Guiana. It was a very important part, but it was a part of that story. And some, to a certain extent, I mean, that's just my personal view, to a certain extent, um, I like that because it's, it, it, it's got a purpose. You know, its purpose is to be part of that story rather than, as, as Graham was saying, being this jewel separated out from the context of where it is. And sometimes that's difficult for the, for the non-knowledgeable, the, the guy who doesn't know much about stamps to suddenly see this piece of paper, in a sense, taken out of context. It's there sitting there in a court. Yeah, well, what is it? It's a piece of paper. Well, no, it's not. It, it's very much um, a, a, a it, it's part of a story about these primitive stamps that were printed in this, as Peter said, this tiny little island that's been, for, this tiny little place that's been forgotten for sorry, it's not an island. For, forgotten for 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 you know for for decades, nobody really goes there, or there's there's no interest, you know. So it's it's lost. But no, it was, and this is a small place. So these were great stamps, famous stamps produced in this small colony that became so famous, which I think is a fantastic story. Yeah, yeah, and one of the um, so I'm just actually wondering. I'm looking on Twitter and seeing kind of if there's any kind of noise about it in our little philatelic world. Graham, do you, is, are you seeing anything on your uh, social channels? I am, yeah, on my various Instagram, Twitter. Um, so yeah, so m mostly disappointment. I know, I, and I absolutely agree that this was, a, it was good that it sold for the price as you both have pointed out. Um, but just realize that this is the heavyweight champion of the world for the philatelic spot. And um, non-collectors and collectors seeing it not even make its estimate and sell for below its previous price 
will immediately have a perception of where the stamp market is, as well as what the stamp means to us. So just keep that in mind. And so I completely see the point of view that I'm seeing on social right now, which is disappointment, shock, what's going on. We just need to keep that in mind that yeah. perhaps a very short holding of the stamp from 2014 to 2021 20, maybe wasn't the best thing for the hobby. Yeah. But that's yeah. that's just that's just what's going on right now. I'm just telling you what what I'm getting on on my social. Right? Yeah, no, that's important because I think that's the point, isn't it? This is about the fact that people are talking about it and people are really excited about what is it going to reach, who is it going to go to, where is it going to end up. Um, and if any of those have a sort of less than what you were hoping for kind of outcome, then mm -hmm. I get again you were talking, weren't you, to um, in one of your YouTube channels, Graham, about how um, you know if it went for above the estimate. Would it have a ripple effect through the market, the stamp market? Would it mean that catalog values and other areas were coming up? And I think the sentiment from um, Charles was that it wouldn't. However, yeah. indirectly, um, you know, the perception and the softer kind of intangible things that would be around a stamp doing really, really well, high performing gold medal type, it would would maybe get more people talking about it. Maybe this means less people will talk about it you know i think it's it's very interesting um i i'm not sure what the estimate was for the um uh, plate block of four of the of the inverted jenny um but i think that met its target no yeah, it was five, just uh, under just under did, yeah it was did five it meet its seven. target no a well, fraction under the bottom estimate okay hammer, hammer price um, was four million and it was but, but yeah. you know that that <laughs> I think there is a point here, which 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 has kind of been kicked around a little bit. Because this stamp has not been owned by a philatelist for the last um, six or seven, eight years, um, it's kind of, it's become iconic. It, it's become an object of, of virtue, if you like. Um, but it hasn't really moved the collectors of, the, of, of, of stamps. Or I don't think it has. I think it's it's kind of moved into an area of 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 um, expensive and beautiful things, um, but it could equally have been an old Bugatti, or it could have equally been um, you know a, a picture painted by by uh, uh, you know one of the one of the more famous artists, a Canaletto or something. Um, whereas in the stamp world. Um, it's more exciting to actually sit through the sale of all of the British Guiana stamps um, of, of, of Dupont's collection, or indeed of his Mauritius, which, which uh, Marcus was talking about. To a, to, a, to a true philatelist, that kind of thing is much more interesting um, in, in my view. So yes, it's disappointing, um, perhaps to collectors who feel that it ought to have been the pinnacle of a stamp collection. It would be lovely if it was, but it wasn't. It didn't start like that. It's it's not not not, not in this auction. I way back in in the 1870s when 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 little Mr. Vaughan or, or the boy Vaughan found it. Yes, it was. It was going into a stamp collection. He sold it for six shillings. Um, that was then sold on for twenty five pounds, um, and eventually ended up. With a valuation in, in, in 1908 of about 5,000 pounds. Well, that, that in today's money, 5,000 pounds in 1908 in today's money is, is under half a million pounds. Um, so so um, to, to get eight and a half million uh, dollars for it, which is what, six, six million pounds, is it? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty big jump. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing keep on coming back to is that it's in a different category now. Um, I mean, how would that feel, Marcus, in an auction environment? You know, do, is, uh, is this a completely different type of stamp or are there other rarities that you see come up that you, whether it's Feldman or you see elsewhere in other auction houses, where it does play quite significantly under, under the estimate? Well, I think it's well. It, I think it's, you've got to you've got to look at it from a different perspective. We, you've got to look at it from the perspective of um, the who owns it. Um, if the collector 
um, is, and I have to say this, is still alive. Often that has a bearing <laughs> because he has a bearing on what it's what estimates going to be on it. Whereas if a collection is being sold for an estate, uh, sometimes, for example, when we had the collection, that was the beauty of having the Dupont, the the family or the 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 people who were inheriting the money from the Dupont sale wanted to sell it. They didn't they didn't want us to promote it at big figures. They wanted us to sell it. So you put in an estimate that's reasonable and knowing that it's going to go up in value. Um, I, you know, it's, it, I, I think, especially in a forum like this, I have to be careful with what I say, um, you know, in that sense. But I think, I think Sotheby's, I think Sotheby's estimate, and maybe, you know, Peter will agree, I think it was a strong estimate. Um, so that's my view. I'm not saying they did the wrong thing. I think it was a strong estimate. And um, I you know, obviously would have been delighted if they got that. Um, but I, I, at the same time, coming back to, to Graham, and I know that in reality, people are going to look at this as being um, um, sort of negative for the stamp business. And I'm, I'm going to say out, right out there in the public is, in fact, I think it's a great success. And that, yes, it's imperfect and things go up and down. But the key for me, what would we be doing now if we'd been sitting here now saying it didn't sell? Yeah. Then we'd be having yeah. a different conversation, which would yeah. be, in my opinion, much more dramatic. Yeah. But we're not. We're sitting here knowing that it's been sold. And yes, it's moved on to another collector or another institution. Or, But I think... I think, you know, that's it. I mean, I'm a collector. I've sold things from my collection in, in the past. Sometimes I've made money, meaning I've got sold for more than I bought it for. And sometimes I've lost. But as a collector, um, it's the ownership that's the key. You love to have it. I mean, yeah. it's a bit sort of kind of narcissistic or, you know, this desire to have things and own them. But it's wonderful. Ownership of, of something is important. And the ownership and the keeping of it and the writing up of the story and all that is part of what it is to be a collector. The buying of it sometimes is actually secondary and the selling often is secondary. It's that ownership and being able, being part of it. And maybe oh, interesting to talk to Weitzman, you know, to see, to see where he's at today. And maybe yeah. his journey, I would hope his journey has been a fun journey. And it's not about, yeah. and especially if you have the money, it's not about the money in the end. It's about the journey that he was on with that stamp. Yeah, yeah. I think I think he'll be very happy. I must say, uh, but I think just going back to when you asked me, uh, Suzanne, about the um, the symbol on the back of the stamp, I, I think that is the, that is the ownership aspect of it, which yeah. you so, so rightly put over, Marcus. Um, being able to just put a little drawing like that, and it, I might say it's a beautiful drawing, it's absolutely perfect. Um, it really does indicate exactly what Wiseman, Wiseman's life's all been about, which is, which is designing the most beautiful shoes. Um, and and it, somehow that is, adds, I, I think it adds to it, um, uh, not in a philatelic sense at all, but 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 in the in the sense of the mystery and the uh, and the ownership and and the fact that it's there, and I think that's rather lovely. Yeah, it's something. Um, I think that that same thing about being part of the story and feeling like not just the stamp was part of your life, but you were part of the stamp's life, and that stamp is still there. You know, it's not this well, in theory, unless Banks has got it and decided to set it alight or something. <laughs> um, so I think it's that kind of connection with with it um we, we will continue to look for the story you know we will stay connected with that and if i look at something that we're trying to do at stampex for example where we have the exhibit you know the british national exhibits there um we're trying to look for ways in which the exhibitors who have the material can tell their story you know like a small video or something so that it's not just looking at the stamps like you would look at an album but you would meet the person hear what it means to them in their words and that's almost like what we're seeing with this idea of ownership in the Stuart Weinsman story or, or the one that Magenta story entirely is and um, those stories enrich people's engagement with the hobby. I mean, 
49 seconds into posting on the PTS and Stampex Instagram feed, we've had a comment um, which says, I know it doesn't have a massive impact on the stark stamp market, but this price somehow broke my heart. Now that's sad, but that emotional connection which people have with the story. Yes. It's like it makes your skin go a little bit. It's wonderful. Yes. But can we ask Graham with about that? Because I mean, Graham, you have you have I think done an enormous amount over the over the, the, the pandemic time lockdown uh, in bringing philately to to a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise know much about it. Um, and I think you've made it to great interest and, and, and saved a lot of people's boredom over the period. How, how do you feel about the price and about the, particularly about the graffiti on the back and the ownership aspect? Wow, that's a, there's, there's a lot there. Uh, so from the Sorry. price, I, mean, <laughs> I, I completely, um, I, I agree that it's great that it's sold, that it got to where it is. I'm disappointed uh, with my with my community, I'm sure, with with other philatelists out there, that that heavy hitter lost the fight in the sense that it didn't quite make it into its uh, record breaking sale and so on. Um, but to Marcus's point, this is actually a, a good little lessons learned here for stamp collectors that you don't always win, right? Buying something doesn't necessarily mean it goes up in every single time, and um, that 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 is perhaps something that I think myself and the community can walk away with is getting more of an understanding of it's not um, a done deal purchasing something and seeing it appreciate. So uh, maybe there's, there, there's a good spin to it. Um, from the, the, on the back, I don't think, I think that actually drawing on the back, writing on the back is probably highlighting more that this is a trophy item, that this is an opportunity for you to purchase and make your name go down in history and be marked on something that should go on in time and, and your name will be forever recognized. So it might, and this is just a theory, it might actually help because that group of investors or people looking to purchase something that is special and showcase and get their name on something, they might see that as an opportunity because they won't necessarily write on paintings or other items. This is their opportunity to do that. So writing on the back might help it. I'm not a fan of signing the back. Right? I'm not a fan of Stuart Weitzman's signature particularly because it takes up a lot of real, real estate, right? Compared to, you know, <laughs> Ferraris or anybody else's on there. He's, he's just taking up a lot of real estate. Um, but I also see, and I've been introduced to a different point of view in a video I did where I interviewed uh, Charles, uh, from uh, H.R. Harmer, who gave me a, I think, a very compelling argument of how this thing really, how signing it really does help its role in the philatelic space, in um, promoting the hobby and so on. So I, I, I'm impartial to it. I, the, the thing is though, that when my video posted with that particular argument from Charles, the responses in the comments were extremely passionate. And <laughs> there were some people who were just disgusted at the concept of this. There were others that were like finding this was intriguing and perhaps maybe they were won over, but the passion was unbelievable. And I haven't seen that in any other videos I've done, any other comments. So this stamp is doing <laughs> quite a service to philately it's creating those passions it's creating that excitement and um controversy arguments in the hobby are a good thing yeah i think the more of them the better yeah absolutely Completely. so here's a new here's another debate that's just come up on the pts's uh which one is it twitter feed um a discussion about should we be worried about the the the, the hammer price of the two philatelic uh, items. Um, we've got a comment here from the punk philatelist who says that um, it may be, I'm not going to uh, give the whole tweet, but it may be consistent with the fact that over the pandemic there's been no new buyers entering the top end market mm. for Western rarity. So actually, if you think about since 2014, um, again, um, Gerald said this, is that 
it would have, you know, Stuart was one of the people pricing the bidding, making the bidding go higher last time. So it would have taken someone new to come in to bid higher than what Stuart had driven it to last time. And that's only been five, six years of which we are undergoing a global pandemic. Maybe there's just no one coming in at that higher end Western rarities. I guess, Marcus, maybe you've got some insights into whether that's a, 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 a valid comment. Well, I mean, again, going back on the years of experience in, in auctions and seeing it, and, and I'm sure Peter will, you know, from his perspective, will 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 agree. If you go to an auction, it's all, um, you know, it's all very interesting material. It's all priced at reasonable levels, not high, not high value items. Um, it and 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 there's a lot of interest in a particular subject. The room will be full of people, and Everybody will have um, a certain degree of money in their pockets to spend, um, and I, I, th and I think that in any field, and you take, I would imagine, and I would love to actually have a Sotheby's here guy here and ask him what is the situation with the hundred million dollar painting. So let's go to the let's go to the top end of the painting world. Are there 10 people clamoring to buy it at 100 million? And my, my gut feeling is no. That the space at the top end is very, very thin. So in, in the philatelic world, in my opinion, once you get over, let's say 50,000 pounds, $50,000 or whatever it is, the, the numbers are, are reduced quite considerably. Obviously, once you get to 100, again, and when you get to a million, we are talking about single digits. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to even say nine. We're lower than five. That's the number we're talking about. And I think it's always been like that. It's never been rooms full of people clamoring to spend a million, a million pounds or a million dollars on a, on, a, on a stamp. That's just the way it is. And I think that's the same with every single field. That's that's you know I think the coin to to go to the coin and 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 say why um, I'm my gut feeling and I'm convinced that the intrinsic value of gold plays a part. I know the piece the coin is not worth that in gold. We all know that, but it's that intrinsic value. Go people look at a gold coin and they go value gold. And we're we're and that's why I think actually if I was to and this sort of challenges uh, Graham, Graham's view is that I think with stamps it's even more of a miracle because we've got a piece of paper that has absolutely no intrinsic value at all. It's just literally paper. There's and, no, and I would, I would and, trust myself a lot more with a coin than a piece exactly. of paper. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that makes the stamp industry, the stamp world, far more you know, that imperfect market feeling. Um, yes, I mean, there is another point that I'd just like to jump in there, and that is that many stamps uh, are works of art, um, extremely beautiful. Yeah. and demonstrate the skills of the engraver, the printer, the paper maker, the die maker, all of the things which make a, a work of art beautiful. Um, I have to say that a lot of those things are missing in this particular object. Um, you know, it was designed by some, I don't know, I don't know who, but probably a clerk in some, in some post office years ago. Um, uh, when when proper stamps hadn't arrived in time, and um, you know, there's a, there's a long story behind it, which some people will be able to read about, I'm sure. But but you know, it it doesn't have um, it has it has iconic value. It does not have beauty value. Um, so that when you're buying a paint, uh, there are other things to 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 guide you. Um, it would be interesting if we could find somebody who would like to comment on what you're saying about the art market, uh, Marcus. What I've seen of recent date is that it's booming, but um, uh, that's mainly because I, I think people are using it as an investment tool and there's an enormous amount of liquidity in the world. Um, and that's one of the reasons why. I mean, 
to that same point around earlier, we talked about would a high or low price on the magenta or the or the block indicate a, a change in the stamp market? I mean, from the philatelic traders' perspective, we know that the philatelic trade has had a really, really good 12 to 18 months. People have had time due to, sadly, a global pandemic, but people have had time to focus on their hobby. And actually, to your point about things are booming, there's, it's not just that there's more being sold, but there's more people starting to engage with the hobby um, through lots of different reasons. You know, I'm sure exploring stamps has meant that we've got a lot more collectors in the world. But, you know, so so that kind of, I guess, plays into the fact that a, a lower price than estimate on the, on this particular item in this particular auction um, doesn't necessarily say that the, the, the market's not doing well, because if anything, I think from a trade perspective, we would say it's the opposite at the moment as well. Agreed. I agree with that. And I think that regardless of what it's sold for today, it's generated that buzz. And in a place that we haven't seen it before, social media at the level it is, I think that is also showing a good sign for the hobby. So I don't think that the hobby is necessarily going to take a hit from this in any way, financial or um, participation from, from that standpoint. It was just that opportunity to try to reach out to more people out there that may catch the glimpse of the news and so on. Uh, but yeah, I think the hobby is in a great place right now. And the fact that people are passionate about it, the fact that people are commenting and uh, reaching out to me, my phone's buzzing consistently. I think uh, it's a very exciting uh, time and this, the sale of the stamp has, has shown that. Maybe people who only had 7 million in their pocket might, yeah. might all start you know, chasing after this thing in a few years time if it comes back on again. That's made it a little bit more reachable. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> we talked about pooling together. Can we together get 10 million quid? Maybe we can get seven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the other exciting question, and I can put this out there, is that, of course, you know, although DuPont was famous, um, I think the the when Stuart bought the stamp, it 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 went to another level because this is a celebrity. Uh, as somebody outside our world. And I think, you know, coming back to Peter's comment about the booming art market, uh, art is bought by dom predominantly, unlike stamps. I mean, there are collectors of art, but predominantly people are not collecting art. They're owning it to display it in their homes. They're owning it as an investment. So they're not really collecting it as such. Um, so it'd be, it'd be interesting to know what, you know, what's the, what, what can we do? Maybe this is a challenge to Graham. What can we do? Because at the, be at the turn of the last century, stamp collecting was a hobby of kings. You know, you had, you know, George, the, George the fifth, you had um, King Carol of Romania. You had uh, the, the, um, uh, Farouk of, of, of um, Egypt, um, you know, you, you had famous, very famous, very famous people collecting. And that switched. And now, yes, the, 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 the famous people collecting art. What would it take? And I think, I think it's all about social media and marketing. What would it take? And I, because I'm, I'm in this world, I, I, I believe it could happen. What could it, what would it take for suddenly stamps that's beyond us to go viral in other words the idea of owning a great stamp to go viral and suddenly somebody like lebron james or somebody out there decides i'm gonna own this or or a famous footballer or, or whatever it might be suddenly you know a, 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 a rooney you know if, if somebody like that bought a stamp that would change almost overnight the perspective of what it is so what would it take maybe for that? Someone, yeah, maybe someone has done that. I don't know. There's quite a battle on, I think, for, for the PTS and for, for um, dealers like Graham, um, who, who I think is, is actually cracking that market head on um, and, and doing a great job. As far as uh, the social side of, of philately is concerned, just one second to, 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 to say something about that, if I may. And that is that if you belong to societies and clubs and organizations that, 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 that come together to look at and enjoy collecting stamps together, 
such as I have to say the Royal Philatelic Society London, uh, you will find that there are a lot of people there who are um, not, not only very knowledgeable, but, but great historians. Many of them um, know a lot about other things too, because, because they have been involved in, in, in uh, collecting, in research work, in libraries, in reading, in all sorts of scholarly pursuits. Um, and, and they bring together uh, at any time a, a really eclectic group of people who have, okay, one major interest perhaps because they're members of a philatelic society, but they bring all sorts of other fascinating things together. Uh, and that's one of the great advantages, I think, of, of, of being able to mix together and, 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 and enjoy one another's company. It hasn't been so much fun on, on Zoom, uh, but Zoom has stepped in where angels fear to tread and uh, it's done a wonderful job. Uh, and so have the other, the other um, uh, you know, what do you call them? Uh, online arrangements and, and, and social media. And that's a fantastic thing. Um, but if anyone's interested in, in, in the great society, the, the oldest society, just give me a call. Be delighted to hear from you. Fabulous. And of course, we're live streaming on Facebook, um, you know, we're across social media at the moment. Um, so we've, I mean, I know that the Royal Philatelic Society is on Twitter and Facebook. So again, if you, you know, want to find out more about the membership, I'm a lifetime member and a fellow of the Royal. And um, equally, if anyone wants to speak to me about the benefits of, of um, joining, do shout out. So you can follow those guys, you can become a member. You can follow the Museum of Philately, which is another fantastic community of, um, of resources to learn, especially about rarities, which of course is part of the topic today. Um, Graham's YouTube channel, uh, you know, as you said, Graham, you get, you know, the comments under your, when your videos are launched, you know, you get so much passion and you also get an incredible amount of knowledge sharing, I know as well, on your channel and across your social streams. So make sure you're following at Exploring Stamps. Make sure you're following us. I'm sure you guys already are. The fact you found us at PTS and Stampex. Um, sign up to the Stampex newsletter at stampexinternational.com, where we try and share as much information as we can about um, the hobby um, and also trade news and, and news about the show and our members. So has anyone got any more comments? Otherwise, I think we will um, close. Um, let people just take a bit of time, whether they're grieving about the price or they just want to <laughs> on some of the conversation that we've had. We certainly will be putting something out in the next Stampex newsletter, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of other um, social conversations going on on about this. <laughs> uh, just one last question, just say, say, I don't think we should be grieving at all. I no, no, I, I know. <laughs> I think we should be rejoicing. I think it's great, a great day for collectibles, you know, whether it's coins or, or stamps or whatever. And uh, it's great to see passion because people are buying and putting their money on something. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. I mean, I, I, as a collector, and I'm sure Peter agrees, you know, there's nothing like the enjoyment of purchasing something that, that, that you've wanted to own. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I, as, as Graham said, we can't wait to know who the owner is, <laughs> you know, of both items, you know, I hope that we've taken people who were sad or disappointed and we've taken them on this journey over the last hour with some, um, some good news and they're now accepting and sort of thinking about how they can uh, you know rethink what, what the, their perception of philately and these types of collectibles is all about. Yeah. Yes you don't have to have 10 million pounds to start collecting stamps. Absolutely you not. You can start today just by going downstairs and seeing what comes through the letterbox Absolutely. and um, then ask mommy and daddy if you're young um, what they've got tucked away. Um, have a look at the, the envelopes that came with your Christmas cards in and um, yeah. go online and find Graham's sites. Um, if you're really interested in, in, in bigger stuff, go to Marcus's uh, website and find great auctions and the PTS will look after you because the PTS gives you the benefit of uh, proper, honest dealing. Thank you, Peter. Right. Comments, Graham, before we close. Yeah, I mean, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. I think it shows the excitement, the passion and the energy that is behind this hobby, yeah? really motivating it. And um, uh, yeah, it's it's the, this thing had a had a hype from the beginning. 
of its announcement. And um, I, I'm just very excited that one, yes, it's solved, but uh, two, that we get to talk about it. We get to talk about the hobby. We get to, we get to showcase um, some of our finest stamps out there. Yes, it might not be the prettiest, but we've got the magenta and you've got those inverted jennies, which I would be very happy to own any of them at this time. So they've come a little bit closer to re being reachable, isn't it? Uh, so yeah, I, I, if, if um, I just make sure if you're, you're starting into the hobby or if you're getting uh, into philately, check out the societies that are out there, such as the Royal Philatelic Society. If you're in the US, check out the APS. I love the Museum of Philately app. I've just done a video where I've showcased it. I'm uh, not sure if anyone's seen that yet. So check that out. I've, I've enjoyed exploring that. Uh, PTF is one of the leaders in engaging the online philatelic community as we're now chatting online live. So that should speak to it a lot. And of course, check out um, Exploring Stamps if you want to learn about the hobby with me as I continue to learn. And this again was a learning moment for me. So um, thank you, uh, Suzanne and PTS for hosting this. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much, everyone. And thank you to everyone who's joined us on Facebook and across the various social channels. The conversation I'm sure will continue. So until next time, thanks very much. Bye now. Thank you.